This time, Reinventing Parking is tackling the issue of motor vehicles parked on sidewalks. Welcome to Reinventing Parking, the podcast about parking policy for anyone who wants a better city and better urban transport. Just a reminder, Reinventing Parking is the official podcast of the Parking Reform Network. Stay on at the end of the episode for some news highlights from the world of parking reform. This episode takes a look at the issue of motor vehicles parked on sidewalks, also known as pavements or footpaths or walkways. Along the way, you'll be hearing from a number of people from around the world. I want to try to better understand the problem and some possible solutions, and I really hope we can leave you with some hope. One lesson is that it is best to act quickly if sidewalk parking emerges. Try hard to not let it become a serious problem in the first place. But even if sidewalk parking has become rampant, change is certainly possible. While there don't seem to be quick and easy answers, many places have successfully tackled this menace. To a great extent, this is a matter of priorities. But we need to get organised. Let's start by asking, what is the problem? What are we talking about here? And is this a widespread problem around the world? My name is Tomasz Walinski. I work for the City of Krakow, Department of Municipal Services and Climate. I think there were streets or areas when you really struggle to walk, especially if you used to walk with a little kid in a pram or with your luggage, whatever. Concerning walking on the pavements, what our law says, it's one and a half meters should be left, but even the two meters should be left for pedestrians. That was like 70% of the case. It was not the case. So you had to really struggle between the cars. My name is George Weeks, and I'm a chartered town planner and urban designer based in Auckland, New Zealand. In any country, it's a universal truth that the driver will try and park their car in any public space that is car-sized. If there's no enforcement, our public space quickly becomes just another car park. This is a problem in central Auckland, which has spent lots of money on high-quality paving in its shared space, which looks great. But all too often, this beautiful paving is hidden under illegally parked cars and trucks. This issue can often be a very serious one, especially for people with some impairment in their mobility, such as wheelchair users, people with visual impairments who may be using a cane or a guide dog, and people with small children, for whom it may be especially dangerous to need to step into the road. And here is Sonal Shah an urban planner and the director of both Urban Catalysts and the Centre for Sustainable and Equitable Cities in Delhi, in India. On some of the major roads, you do observe parking on the footpaths. And is that to the point where people are then forced to walk in the street, in the road? They are then forced to walk on the street, yes, absolutely, absolutely. My name is Nicola Medimorek and I'm Director of Data Analysis and Research at the Slokith Partnership on Sustainable Low Carbon Transport. I have been living in Korea since more than 10 years. So sidewalk parking in Korean cities is a very common issue. You will often come across cars blocking sidewalks and parking where they aren't supposed to. This is often caused by people visiting shops, restaurants or other places nearby and just using the sidewalk in front of their destination. Various motor vehicles are sometimes parked on sidewalks. Mostly we will be talking about cars in this episode. The issue varies depending on the extent to which a parked vehicle actually obstructs the walkway. If a vehicle blocks the sidewalk so that people on foot or in wheelchairs or pushing strollers or prams can't actually pass and have to step into the street, that's a very serious issue, of course, especially if the street is a busy one. In many countries, the problem seems to be mainly in dense residential areas. But where this happens on commercial sections of street, The sidewalk parking is often relatively brief and intermittent, but the problem may impact more people and cause more danger and stress since these are usually busier roadways. Another form of the problem is people parking cars on driveways, but in ways that obstruct the path of pedestrians. 
in some parts of many cities, minor streets don't actually have a clearly defined sidewalk or footpath. This may or may not be a serious problem. In Japan, for example, it's not usually a problem. These are very quiet streets with very low speed traffic. But the parking of motor vehicles on streets that don't have a sidewalk can be a problem. For example, in India, here is Sonal Shah again. In residential neighbourhoods, even if you have a road that is about 12 metres or so, you have a carriageway and there's enough parking, right? And, and so there are no footpaths. So this is an example of a case where, you know, it becomes the road that becomes a shared street and um, you, have, you have no footpaths, but you only have parking. It often blocks the part of the right-of-way that is safest for pedestrians so that they end up walking between the parked vehicles and the moving traffic. You won't be surprised to hear that sidewalk parking is widespread in places like China, India, Indonesia, Kenya, Colombia. Twelve years ago when I looked into this, I heard that sidewalk parking was a serious issue also in Mexico, Tanzania and Vietnam. I wouldn't be surprised if it still is. A quick tour with Google Street View suggests that it's a problem across many parts of Asia, Africa and Central and South America, with some variations from place to place in exactly how this plays out. But parking on footways, sidewalks, is not just a problem in low-income and middle-income countries. In fact, if my Twitter feed was a reflection of reality, then you would conclude that the most serious sidewalk parking problems are in the UK, Ireland, Germany... New York City, Taiwan, or in a few other rich places. Even in Singapore, I still do often come across cars parked in driveways that are blocking the walkway, blocking the sidewalk. This seems to be an especially big issue in the UK. Here is Carlton Reid, a veteran journalist in the United Kingdom whose work focuses on urban mobility. In some countries, you weren't allowed to park on the, the sidewalk. And... We've had that law, and it's still, in fact, law in the UK from that 1835 Highway Act. But it's absolutely flouted regularly, and that's partly, or very much because, it's not enforced by the police. And local authorities who are supposed to do the enforcing say, well, we can't enforce it because we're not the police. So it falls down these cracks of there's nobody out there really taking it very seriously. And... At the moment, we have this uh, UK government analysis of it and looking at it, and Commission have actually looked at to how we can solve the, the problems. But we've had many, many similar exact same analyses in the past, and they've never been enacted. What mo- most police forces tend to do is they say, when there's an obstruction of the highway, and it's very, very obvious, they will do something about that. But, but of course, the highway in, in UK law isn't the carriageway. It's the whole width of what we consider to be a road and a sidewalk. And that's the whole of that is the highway. In theory, they should be enforcing obstructions to bicycles and pedestrians as well. Mm. If if it's a car, if a a motorist is parked on the sidewalk, that is an obstruction of the high, de facto obstruction of the highway. But we've turned a blind eye to that. A few police forces do actually enact this and, and do enforce it. And then you get all these incredible... Uh, letters in the local media, you know, people complaining, say, well, I've always parked as It's like, yep, yeah, you're not allowed to. You always have, but you've never been allowed to do that. There are numerous online social media accounts across the UK and Ireland dedicated to shaming bad parking, especially sidewalk parking, or, as they call it, pavement parking. The same is true in German cities. Many German cities seem to institutionalise sidewalk parking by marking out spaces that are half on, half off the sidewalk, especially in dense residential areas. My name is Andreas, and under my Twitter handle, NoParkDO, I post photos of parking violators in Dortmund, Germany. I started this to show how much the car dominates the city. Here in Dortmund, we have, as in most European cities, too much cars for the public space. Sidewalks are used as a parking spot, which is normally illegal in Germany. If the car owners get too much fines, the municipality often legalizes it instead of stopping it. All of this leads to parked up streets in which there is no more room for people. 
We heard from Nicola in Korea just now, but he is originally from Germany and had some insights on that country too. It is clear from his comments that this is a matter of priorities. City centers have designated parking and they take high fees for parking and also like then try to not make it possible that people park on the sidewalk but use designated um, areas. However, in the suburbs, parking is free. It can be done almost anywhere and there's very re limited regulations and there are no efforts done to reduce sidewalk parking at scale. Take away space from pedestrians, make it difficult for two people to walk next to each other. Even navigating with a baby stroller or with a wheelchair can be a real problem in, in many uh, German suburbs. Cities support car parking on the sidewalk because they prioritize the traffic flow. Germany in general has a good and strong enforcement of parking regulations, but in a system where private vehicles and the private vehicle usage is prioritized, it has very limited impacts. Cars and motorcycles parked on sidewalks is also a big issue in Taiwan. The Twitter handle Taiwan Pedestrian Memorial, Pedestrian TW, has numerous images of haphazard illegal parking on sidewalks and even legal marked parking for motorcycles and motor scooters on sidewalks in, in Taiwan. Here is Nicola again, this time talking about Korea. And actually, on every kind of Korea, you can find the phone number of the owner, because especially in neighborhoods with um, multi-story housing or detached houses, you will see cars parked and blocking each other very often. And I think that this behavior swaps over to pavement parking. A car owner might assume that somebody will call them in case that their vehicle is a disturbance, and so they might be more likely to park the vehicle somewhere it isn't supposed to. I'm from Australia, and some of the inner areas in Melbourne and Sydney have serious problems with sidewalk parking. We'll hear more about the United States shortly, but one hotspot for sidewalk parking seems to be New York City. And it's a little shocking because the problem there seems to be the abuse of placards by police and fire station employees. In other words, the main culprits parking on sidewalks in New York City seem to be city employees themselves, including the very people who are supposed to be enforcing against the problem. Yikes. You get the picture. Motor vehicles parked on sidewalks is a problem in many places, but not everywhere. Where is it not much of a problem? Are there places that have solved this problem? And how did they do it? I asked on social media for tips on places where sidewalk parking is not much of a problem or places that have solved the problem. Several people mentioned cities in the Netherlands. So the question arises, has it ever been a problem in the Netherlands? And a quick image search for street scenes from the Netherlands in the 1970s very quickly reveals that, yes, sidewalk parking was a serious issue in the past. So whatever it is that the Netherlands has done since then, it seems to be working. Several people also mentioned French cities. Anders Hartmann in Norway shared via Twitter that bike lane parking is rampant, but sidewalk parking is relatively rare in Norway. It is almost only done for loading and unloading or while waiting, and rarely ever forces pedestrians onto the roadway. The fine is about 90 euros. Jose Ibarra in Lausanne, Switzerland, tells me that sidewalk parking is under control in Switzerland too. Some places that you might have expected to have a serious problem, such as some of the southern European countries, actually seem to be doing really well. For example, a number of Spanish cities seem to have quite a good grip on this issue. A Google Maps Street View zoom around Madrid and Barcelona didn't reveal very much in the way of sidewalk parking at all. Similarly, I hunted around in Naples, in Italy. There was plenty of chaotic parking, but the sidewalks were mostly clear, although they were rather narrow, which suggests another variation on this problem. Cases in which pedestrian space has actually formally been taken away and given to parking and traffic space. Rebecca Clements, a previous guest on the Reinventing Parking podcast, reminded me that this is very rarely ever an issue in Japan. More surprising to me, several people mentioned that sidewalk parking is not really a problem across most of the United States and Canada. Here's Stephen Smith in New York City who writes on Twitter as Market Urbanism. 
I think one of the countries that's done the best in uh, getting cars off the sidewalk or maybe never even having them on to begin with is the United States. You rarely see them. A lot of urbanists in like New York City or other dense areas will complain about it. But, you know, compared to Europe or other other places in the world, it's actually relatively rare. So what can be done? How can this problem be solved? We have a few examples of places where this is not a problem. What's their secret? Let's talk about that North American example. Why is it that sidewalk parking is not a problem across most of the United States and Canada? I think the reasons are not uh, exactly indicative of great parking management. For one, uh, American streets almost always, the street is flanked by two rows of solidly parked cars. So there's not really a way to get onto the sidewalk. But secondly, the, the country is just so car oriented and has so much parking so much off-street parking, so much on-street parking, that it's not very common for it to actually be that useful to park on the sidewalk. So, you know, again, you do see it in some places in New York City, around the country near like fire stations, for example, but it's not that common. But I don't really think that America's parking management is something to emulate. So is the solution simply to have plentiful parking, both off-street parking and formal on-street parking? Well, Stephen suggests that abundant parking should not be our preferred solution, and I agree with him. Many other episodes of this podcast have highlighted that aiming for plentiful parking is not a good idea. It's not the reinventing parking or parking reform network preferred solution. It's not even a feasible solution for most cities and for the parts of cities with this problem. What about a pragmatic solution of simply enforcing that There should be enough walking space for pedestrians to make their way along the sidewalk, even if there are vehicles obstructing part of the sidewalk. This is actually a common approach. Let's hear from Tomasz in Krakow, in Poland, about this. The problem is, unless it is uh, forbidden by the sign, people, you know, like, oh, there's no enforcement here, maybe I can park, maybe not. Let's try, They, they, of course, never measured the the space they, they leave for pedestrian even if it was quite obvious they don't live even the one and a half meters so i would say it was not enforced in in a in a, in a proper way just to clarify then even now if there's no sign the law says that a motorist could park their car with say two wheels up on the pavement so long as they leave two meters or Yes, more or less we could we could uh, define it that way uh, instead of a uh, paid parking zone when it, it, then it's clear only the the really signage uh, shows the when you can park the vertical signs unfortunately it seems difficult to enforce or to adopt any designs that make this uh, self-enforcing so maybe this is not the best approach How about something that uh, Tomas just mentioned? Another way to reduce sidewalk parking problems seems to be parking management, more intensive parking management. This seems especially relevant to cases where parking on sidewalks is happening in commercial areas or on commercial streets or on mixed-use streets. When the parking management is, is stepped up, including parking pricing and including improvements to the enforcement, that does seem to, generally speaking, solve the problem. Here is Carlton in the UK again. Well, in city centres, you, you tend not to get away with parking where, where you like, and that's because they're, they're generally charged. And wherever, you know, somebody can make money from this, well, they'll enforce it. So those, those zones are different. So parking management seems to work in part because pricing helps regulate demand, but it's also the enforcement and the fact that in a priced area, enforcement is actually carried out. This suggests that even just improving enforcement should be able to make a difference, even enforcement alone without pricing. The difficulty is in sustaining that enforcement where it's needed and as long as it's needed. Here is some insight uh, from Nicola in Korea, which offers clues on this and confirms this observation. The issue here is a lack of enforcement. The charges for illegal parked vehicles are very low, low until recently, and just got raised some months ago. Authorities do patrol around the city, sometimes even with cars that have cameras on top of them. 
there's even a smartphone app where any citizen can report illegal, illegally parked vehicles by taking two pictures within five minutes. However, total enforcement reporting is only done from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. So in the evening, the situation is really um, much worse. Here's a quote from a 2019 article on the Greater Auckland site, which was republished last week. Here's the quote from the author Heidi. Ten years ago, Aucklanders understood the law. You could not park a car on a verge or footpath, and vehicle crossings were for crossing the footpath, not places to park. If you parked there for more than a minute or three, you'd be ready with an apology. Now, cars are littering the public realm. Pedestrian malls, public plazas, footpaths, verges, driveways, edges of parks, bollarded off-service driveways, you name it. If drivers can physically manoeuvre a car into position, they will. From this, it seems clear that consistent enforcement can keep sidewalk parking under control, even outside the areas with priced parking, as it used to in Auckland. But if the enforcement lapses, as it apparently has in Auckland, bad parking can easily become a new norm. It's also very clear that good design of the on-street parking, whether it's in residential areas or in other areas, is a really important part of the solution. It, it's very apparent looking at the, the streets in Dutch cities, Spanish cities, French cities. Here's Carlton again talking about European cities. The UK went down this route of double yellow lines to demarcate where you weren't allowed to park, whereas in many other European countries, and the Netherlands is a, a, a good example, uh, it's the opposite. You've basically got markings to say where you can park. So part of good design for preventing or at least making it less likely that people will park on the sidewalks is about making it extremely clear to motorists where parking is allowed, where it is desired and where it is not allowed. For example, in streets in the Netherlands, and increasingly in France and Spain too it seems, Parking is designed to be clearly outside the carriageway for vehicle movement. Spaces are marked between curb extensions, trees and street furniture, for example, and no other spaces in the street seem at all inviting to park on, certainly not straddling the sidewalk and the carriageway. Tomas in Krakow made a similar point about both parking design and the broader traffic system. So then some people want to park uh, everywhere, including the, the pavement areas. But I would say if you look at the overall organization of traffic and of car movement, including parking, it has really improved in a designing step already. So in many cases, you try to design in a way that it enforces uh, itself, I would say. It's not feasible to, to park there. So in those streets where you have tackled this issue successfully. Do you think the primary thing is what you just said, the self-enforcement, maybe bollards and barriers and good design so that it's self-enforcing and it's clear? Is that the number one solution or is it sometimes purely enforcement? Yeah, I would say, unfortunately, we still have to use in many, many cases, like you said, the bollards, the physical barriers. We try to le replace them with the bicycle racks, which at least looks a little bit nicer. And we g gain some extra parking space for bicycles. And so many of these success story cities seem to be making very liberal use of bollards and barriers of some kind that just physically prevent at least cars and delivery vehicles from parking on the sidewalks. It's not so easy to prevent motorcycles parking where they shouldn't, but bollards do very effectively prevent parking on the sidewalks in many areas of especially European cities. Here's George Weeks. Relying on drivers' goodwill doesn't work because it takes just one driver to behave badly, parking in the shared space and spoiling it for everyone else. No, the trick is to restrict the spaces where cars can go, and this brings me on to bollards. If you want to have footways and shared spaces that are free from parked cars, you need to exclude the cars systematically and meticulously. And the only way to do this is to use physical measures, and nothing beats a bollard. 
go to any French city and you will see that they use bollards relentlessly. French bollards are slim, elegant and very strong. Drive a car into a bollard and the car will bend. French drivers are no better behaved than elsewhere. Bollards help to encourage good driver behaviour in French streets. You will see narrow bollards at Parisian pedestrian crossings to stop taxi drivers from pulling up onto the curb. You see bollards in the boulevards of Bordeaux, keeping the footways in the shopping areas free from parked cars. Most bollards are fixed into the ground, but you also have electric rising bollards that allow special vehicles through with a permit, but which block all the other vehicles. And in narrow, historic streets throughout France, bollards make sure that drivers only go where they're meant to go, and this makes for a much calmer, quieter and more livable city. I asked Sonal Shah about self-enforcing design to prevent sidewalk parking in Indian cities, where the older approach was to have very high curbs. So high curbs, certainly not recommended. And then you see that a lot in, in Delhi precisely for this reason. The footpaths tend to be about one foot to 30 centimetres high. I think the bonards, I don't know if they've been very successful with two-wheeler parking, right? Or two-wheeler movement as well. I do know of implementation experiences in Bangalore around this. I think they can work for cars, but not for two-wheelers. But then what happens is that there is a lot of negotiation that happens in the design of the street itself to prevent some of these from coming up. Are there any cases or cities in India that are dealing with this problem effectively that we could point to? Yeah, I think some streets in the central business district of Bangalore could be those where you do have streets that have been redesigned and then bays have been carved out for parking. I, I think I would say better uh, because you still do have vehicles who use the footpaths during the peak hours. In city centres, an alternative to strong management of the on-street parking is to remove parking altogether from many streets and to reclaim that space for other purposes. Or to remove both parking and traffic to create pedestrian zones. Oslo, Amsterdam and Paris come to mind with both of those strategies. This approach is a reminder that solving sidewalk parking need not be about better parking in itself, it can, and maybe should, be about making a much better environment for people on foot, in wheelchairs, with luggage, with children. Krakow in Poland has been doing some of this too. Actually, we have almost the biggest pedestrianized area in Europe, so this makes you feel really good as a tourist, as as a people walking. Now, some of this parking that's removed is replaced off-street or in underground parking, mainly on the edges of these city centres. But it is still clear that reducing sidewalk parking does not necessarily require plentiful parking. Let's shift our focus again back to residential pavement parking problems and think about attacking this from another angle by thinking about car ownership itself, even though that is something of a taboo in many places. Maybe we can look to Japan. Japan's proof of parking law requires residents to prove that they have access to a parking place, either on their own property or leased nearby, in order to register a car. Combined with a ban on on on-street parking overnight, this serves to make sure that there's basically zero nuisance parking by residents in Japanese cities. Now, this option is pretty hard to replicate in other places, but it does remind us that we shouldn't ignore the issue of car ownership levels when thinking about the problem of sidewalk parking in residential streets. And in fact, a variation on that theme is to have pricey parking permits, at least in areas where there is a very high demand for on-street parking by residents. And these are the places where residential sidewalk parking is typically a really serious problem. In a recent episode of Reinventing Parking, we heard from Stockholm, where residential on-street parking is very expensive. Vilnius in Lithuania also has very high prices for residential parking permits. 
And the mayor of Williams is famous for driving, what was it, a tank, I think it was, over a, an illegally parked car. So I gather Vilnius has, is pretty serious about solving this problem. So I, I don't think we should dismiss the idea that in hotspots of pavement parking, especially residential parking, the levels of car ownership in those areas should be on the agenda as maybe a slow motion way to deal with the problem. Even places like New York City, we can think of them in this light. Enforcement in New York City over many decades has been at least good enough to deter anyone from regularly parking their car on the sidewalks overnight, you know, long term. And so just good enough enforcement against nuisance parking by residents is important. And it seems to be part of the secret of keeping car ownership at least low enough, somewhat low anyway. Some might argue that these areas would be better off with even lower car ownership, but car ownership is not so high in these areas that people are resorting to sidewalk parking. Presumably similar comments apply to, to the inner city areas of many cities around the world. I want to finish up now. We've heard that sidewalk parking is a very widespread problem. If it's bad where you are, then you are not alone. But many places have tackled it successfully. There don't seem to be any quick and easy solutions, but there are solutions. Sidewalk parking does not have to be a long-term fact of life. In fact, there is a concerted campaign by the UK charity for everyday walking, Living Streets, along with partners, including guide dogs, sustrans, and the Royal National Institute of Blind People. Maybe it's time to get organised. That seems to have been an important part of Kravkov's sidewalk parking story. Here's Tomas to end the episode for us. The process of really removing the pavement parking in many, many places in our city started like in 2015, more or less. So it's quite a, quite a new story. I think it started also with some really bottom-up pressure from, from the users, from the pedestrians, from cycling organizations. And now, as promised at the beginning, here are some news highlights from the Parking Reform Network and the wider world of parking reform. The Parking Reform Network has been holding regular organizing roundtables where network members can meet others who are working on parking policy reform and get inspiration and advice. If you're interested, please join PRN and get involved. In early July, India's Urban Works held a successful Park It Right parking reform workshop in Surat in Gujarat that featured a new version of my parking management game which lets participants gain a strong appreciation of the power of parking management, especially parking fees. That was great to see. Oslo, Norway, seems set to abolish all of its remaining parking mandates soon. There will be no more minimum parking requirements for new residential. Commercial developments already had no parking minimums. On 11th of July, Carlton Reed, who featured in this episode had an article on the Forbes website about Milan's astonishing program of expanding and reclaiming public space, much of it by putting former car parking space to better uses. On 20th of July, Chicago City Council approved a landmark transit-oriented development ordinance expansion that enables exemptions from parking mandates and imposes parking maximums in a majority of the city. On the 21st July, Oregon's Land Conservation and Development Commission adopted permanent rules which will require 81 cities in the state's metropolitan areas to eliminate parking mandates within three quarters of a mile of rail or half a mile of transit or for supportive and infill housing. All of this by the end of 2022. Parking Reform Network's Parking Mandates Abolition Map has been improved with the help of intern Aidan Simpson. There have also been numerous updates in the last two months as the movement to abolish or reduce parking minimums seems to be gathering momentum. That's all for this month. You've been listening to the Reinventing Parking podcast, and I'm Paul Barter. You can find out more at reinventingparking.org. 
where you'll find ideas and tips on parking policy. You can also listen to other episodes, subscribe, or leave a comment. That's reinventingparking.org. Bye for now.